The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles. They're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. And brands like Porsche, Skoda, Rolls-Royce, they all honed their craft on the research and development that was needed to win wars. Gotta get back to work. May 1945, Albert Goering, director of the Skoda Arms Factory, is arrested and placed under investigation at Nuremberg for collaborating with his Nazi brother. On paper, this is an open and shut case. A family member of one of the world's most infamous Nazis who made money, who profited from the sale of armaments. He even used slave labor. He had been to Theresienstadt concentration camp and picked up a supply of prisoners who went into his factory to work and were never seen again. Despite the damning list against him, Albert Goering seemed unnaturally calm. He sits down in front of his interrogators in 1945 and just slides this pathetic little dog-eared bit of paper across the table with 34 names on it. Now, these names include the composer of The Merry Widow, Franz Lihar. They also include Dr. Kurt Schusnig, the former Chancellor of Austria, and even Archduke Joseph Ferdinand, last of the Habsburg dynasty. This list is bonkers, and they look at this list of celebrities and they're like, and? Well, what is this? And Albert very calmly tells them that this is a list of 34 prominent figures and families that he had rescued from the Nazi regime. He basically claims to be another Oskar Schindler. He claims that he was playing his brother the whole time, pretending to collaborate by managing this arms factory while secretly spiriting Jews out of the country and away from the Nazi regime. We have here a man who spent the war and before the war, incidentally, developing a side shuffle in freeing persecuted peoples, Jews, helping liberate targeted individuals at threat from the Nazi regime. And of course, he's perfectly placed to do that. Why? Well, he's got the cover of his big brother. No one's gonna suspect a man called Goring who works in the Skoda factory, are they? This is the extraordinary true story of how the Skoda arms factory worked to sabotage the German war machine with the aid of the Nazi's brother. In 1866, an enterprising young technician called Emil Skoda was appointed chief engineer of the Wallenstein Foundry Works in Pilsen, Bohemia. Emil Skoda was a brilliant engineer, but more he was brilliant at seeing gaps in the market and pushing his engineers for it. Kind of like a 1900s version of Elon Musk. His biggest problem actually was his boss, Count Wallenstein Wartenberg, who was a much more cautious individual than he was, and he didn't really see the need to take the risks that Emil wanted to take. In the end, his boss gets totally fed up with this. He's not cut from the same cloth. So what does he do? No, he doesn't fire Skoda. He sells his company to him. Over to you, my friend. Now free to pursue his instincts, Skoda spent the next 20 years retooling the plant into a state-of-the-art steelworks. By 1890, the Skoda plant was turning out high-quality steel castings for all kinds of marine ships, and also turning out boilers and steam engines and all manner of mining equipment. 
the stuff which is really, really important to get right. If you consider the amount of ships and steam trains which blew up because of faulty boilers, you were making your name doing high quality engineering. The equivalent today would be people manufacturing high-end electronics. But Skoda thinks, hang on, we're missing something here. There's a gap in the market. What Skoda begins to realize is that the big money lies in weaponry, armaments. And he was already supplying the Navy with turrets for his battleships. So he thought, why am I making the turrets for battleships when actually I could be making the guns as well. It's a no-brainer. In 1896, he added an arms manufactory to his already burgeoning empire. But it wasn't all plain sailing. Few men ever lost money in providing weapons to kill people with, but Emil Skoda was one of them. The problem was investment. To produce modern weaponry, you need a lot of specialist tools. It had to be high spec. Killing machines needed to be very efficient to sell on a very competitive market. Especially if you're producing rifled barrels or barrels for large caliber guns, you will need a lot of very precise equipment. You needed precision, tooling and machinery, and you needed know-how, and none of that comes cheap. Skoda did not turn a profit until 1906. And unfortunately, by that time, he was dead. Emil Skoda died in 1900. He didn't live long enough to see his plans come to fruition. But the corporation he left behind would eventually start repaying its investors' faith in his vision handsomely. What saved Skoda's company, if saves the right word, was the overambition of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In the run-up to World War I, Europe was dominated by warmongering imperial powers prepared to spend a fortune on armaments. The Habsburgs of Austria were one of them. In 1902, Skoda gained a monopoly supplying weapons to the Austro-Hungarian Navy, just at a point when naval investment was going through the roof. The naval arms race during the early 20th century was absolutely insane. It was a global naval race. There are lots of nations building ships. Everyone wants to have control of the sea. It's all about building your navy up to compete with the likes of the Royal Navy and the French Navy, which were miles ahead of the German and Austrian rivals. Between 1889 and 1914, when war finally breaks out in Europe, the size of the Austro-Hungarian Navy alone has increased sixfold. This is great for Skoda because the ships are a means to ferry very large guns around, so they need a lot of guns to equip them. Especially when we're talking about dreadnought battleships with their big guns. And the company that's exclusively supplying their guns and turrets is Skoda. At the start of the Great War, Skoda's weaponry was in great demand. Thanks to their experience with naval munitions, Skoda very quickly earns a reputation for heavy artillery. And everyone wanted their guns. From 1914 to 1918, Skoda produced 13,000 artillery pieces for Austro-Hungary, but they also supplied them to the Ottoman Empire and to other nations as well who were fighting as their allies. Pretty much every army that was on the side of the Central Powers in the First World War relied on Skoda's 100mm cannon. In fact, the guns were so good that when the Allies captured them, they would often try and make use of them because they were reliable, good quality machines. By the end of the First World War, Skoda's workforce, much like every other armaments company, had just exploded. They'd gone from 10,000 employees to 35,000. But then all of this comes to a massive grinding halt in 1918, because there is no more war and nobody needs weapons anymore. As the Great War staggered to a close, Skoda was forced to look for new markets. With the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which of course disintegrates at the end of the First World War, Skoda loses its main client. The basket case that was 
Austria Habsburgs has just imploded. So what does Skoda do? Well, all is not lost because they are in the brand shiny new country otherwise known as Czechoslovakia, cooked up at the Paris Peace Conference. That's okay, they need to arm themselves, so that's business for Skoda, but it's not enough business. Luckily, as a foreign policy decision, it works for other powers to have Skoda in existence and for them to carry on supplying arms to all of the countries that surround Germany. All sorts of countries, Poland, Greece, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Switzerland, even Italy, were buying what Skoda was producing. Skoda was the arms manufacturer for Central and Eastern Europe. There was no Russian competition thanks to the communist takeover. There was no German competition thanks to the Krupp works having been shut down. And the British competition, Armstrong Whitworth, had just spent the previous war supplying most of the weapons which had blown up large chunks of their countries. So people didn't really want to buy them. Skoda made money. Skoda is now one of the biggest players in that market. But a new power is rising in the Reich, and it casts covetous eyes upon the innovating arms factory in the upstart state of Czechoslovakia. Adolf Hitler hated Czechoslovakia and with good reason. Czechoslovakia was an entirely new country. She was created in this post-war settlement, the Treaty of Versailles, but she was an artificial state in many ways. You've got Czechs in the West, Slovakians in the East, and smeared around that Western border, controversially, about three million Germans in a region known as the Sudetenland. Now, the Sudetenland had a strong Austrian population and a strong German population. This meant that there were large numbers who were not really keen on being where they were. The thinking was, of course, at the time of Versailles, you can't have a resurgent Germany, so let's trim it a bit. Cut off some Germans, ideally those located in industrial heartlands give it to Czechoslovakia and therefore weaken Germany's capacity to rearm. But like much of the Versailles settlement, the idea backfired spectacularly. The partitioning of the Sudetenland was a running sore in the Weimar Republic. In Germany, post-World War I, it was seen as arbitrary, very unfair. Basically, the removal of millions of Germans. Almost every German hates the fact that these native Germans and Austrians are being forced to live in this new upstart state of Czechoslovakia. That same population which lived in that area was ripe for exploitation. Any slight, any feeling that the central government had ignored them could be taken advantage of by a wily politician in Germany or Austria. So when you have the Nazi party under Hitler turning this into a cause celebre, it becomes a really obvious rallying cry. Use it to justify the expansion and the rebuild of a new German Reich. So you have Angelus pushing into Austria and you have the grab for the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. But Hitler and the Nazis had much more sinister reasons for union with Czechoslovakia than the fate of three million German nationals. Hitler didn't give a flying hoot about the Sudetenland. It didn't matter to him. The people didn't really bother him. What mattered to him was the Skoda works. That's what he wanted. And he wanted Skoda for a very particular reason. When Hitler's rearming in the 1930s, he's pretty aware that he may well have to fight a war on two fronts. You've got to knock out your opponents in the West, Britain and France, and actually to maintain resources, to fulfill your Lebensraum dream, you have to head east into Russia. If you're gonna fight a two-fronted war, you need to box clever. So his generals developed this really revolutionary idea, actually first tested by the British, as a way of conducting this really lightning-fast campaign that can knock out the enemies on one front quickly, swiftly redeploy to face the second front behind them. It's going to be famously known as the Lightning War, Blitzkrieg, the key component of which is the tank. 
tanks were fairly new to the battlefield in the 1930s. They first made their entrance in the Battle of the Somme in 1916. They had come a long way in the First World War and they were part of the all arms victory, the Allies. But by 1930s, we're already a world away from the tanks that you see at the end of the First World War. These newer tanks were lighter and much faster, capable of speeds of up to 40 kilometers an hour or 24 miles per hour. They also packed a bigger punch. They had a small cannon in the turret and were backed up by machine guns. If you combine these things with a fast moving motorized brigade, these panzers, as they're called, tanks, they're gonna really punch their way through enemy positions and encircle opponents and sever their supply lines. The chief architect of the Panzer tank Blitzkrieg was a German general called Heinz Guderi. And he reckoned that with just nine or ten Panzer divisions, he could take out any European country in a few weeks. But the Germans didn't have nine Panzer divisions. Hitler had been forced to rearm in secret before 1935, and what he had to do was to disguise his brand new tanks as agricultural machinery. By the start of 1938, he was lagging way behind his vision of where the army should be. OK, he had 600,000 men, but he only had three panzer divisions. And the tanks in those divisions were not the monsters most people think of when they picture German panzers. This is the Panzer III, the standard medium German tank of the Blitzkrieg. It's got 50 millimeters of armor, most of them mount a 37 millimeter gun, and it could hold its own against the British Crusader in the Western Desert. It struggled in 1940 against the French Char B and was no match at all for the T-34. Worse still, there weren't very many of them. For the invasion of Poland, just 98 of them. Hitler needed something else to bulk up his panzer forces, and he knew where to go to get them. What he's thinking about, what he wants, is a tank factory. He needs a good, efficient one, and especially he wants the one which is supplying tanks to Poland, to all his potential enemies because that's what the Skoda works are doing. They are providing artillery, they're providing tanks, good quality tanks, to all his potential enemies in front of his Liebenschrank. In 1935, Skoda develops a new generation of light tank, primarily for the Czechoslovakian army. The LT-35 produced in 1935 is armed with a 37mm gun, which is bigger than most other tanks at this time, or it can take a smaller rapid-firing cannon. It's got a machine gun to deal with troops. It is reliable, it is effective, and it is cost-effective. So you can buy them in large numbers. It's basically what you want a tank to be. It's not as fast as some of its German counterparts, but to be fair, as they break down more than it, it probably gets there about the same time. An improvement on their LT-34 light tank, the Czechoslovakian army had 298 LT-35s scheduled for service by 1939. And Hitler wanted them, along with the rest of Skoda's weaponry. If he can get that factory, that's a negative to his enemies. If he can get it under his own control, then that gives him that production, which gives him those tanks, which is a big win, and it takes it from the enemy. So it's a double win. What happens next is one of the most hotly debated moments in the history of Hitler's rise. Because in September 38, Hitler begins amassing this rearmed German army on the Czechoslovak border, and he is absolutely itching for a fight. A little war, something which will give him a quick victory and show his power to the world. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to read his cards. He's pushed into the Rhine, he's stuffed his way into Austria. What's next? He makes a play for Czechoslovakia. And he's banking on Britain and France being too spineless to come to Czechoslovakia's aid. And remember, France in particular is meant to be the big backer of Czechoslovakia. Hitler is gambling.
By October 1938, Adolf Hitler and the Western Allies are playing a high-stakes game of poker with the fate of Czechoslovakia. And Hitler holds all the aces. Both Britain and France at this time are absolutely terrified of getting dragged into a war and they're not ready to fight. So come 1938, when Hitler's pushing their backs against the wall, neither of them wants to commit. They don't feel ready. And then you've got Allied intelligence estimates that Germany can mobilise up to 90 military divisions. That's more than a million men. In fact, Allied intelligence is wrong. In 1938, Germany can barely muster 38 divisions for the invasion, only three of them armoured. Ranged against them, the Czechs can raise up to 57 divisions with better tanks. The Germans only have six weeks of supplies with which to conduct their blitzkrieg. And the Czechs have the Skoda works. The Skoda works are key. They're a symbol of what the Czechs were capable of. The Czechoslovakians had put a new prime minister into place to deal with the crisis, Jan Sivroy. He'd been a general who'd served with distinction in World War I, and his plan was to really dig in and wait for the Allies to come. The Czechoslovakian army had even bought a set of fortress gun emplacements from Skoda, similar to the Maginot Line. So the Czechs are prepared to fight a waiting game. But this is the wrong strategy. What needs to be remembered is that Germany has been preparing to fight a very different kind of war to the one that everybody else is preparing for. The Germans were not built around a long-term war. They were built around a six-week war. That's how long they had supplies for. You've got to remember that the Germans conquered France in six weeks. Blitzkrieg was called lightning war for a reason. On paper, the Czechoslovakian army looks pretty good. But when you take out fortress battalions, the 17 divisions of untrained reserves, and the fact that it only has 17 battle-ready divisions to face Germany's 38 battle-ready divisions... Frankly, there's every possibility that if the Czechs had resisted in 1938, things would have gone just as badly for them as they did for Poland in 1939. But the Czechs are never given the chance to prove their mettle. Everyone had bought into Hitler's overconfident propaganda, including Hitler himself, frankly. Hitler's aura of confidence pays off. Hitler's playing a bit of a game of call my bluff. Yeah, he's seeing how far he can push what he knows are reluctant allies. These guys have not wanted war, they've not rearmed. And that is precisely what happens, because the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, notoriously flies out to Munich, signs that infamous piece of paper that brings supposedly peace in our time. He even gets to stand on the balcony with the king, celebrating this great peace he's bought in 1938. And by the way, nobody thought to invite to this infamous meeting the leader of the Czechs. You know, Czechoslovakia is sold down the river, floated down the river. Why? Because Hitler gets the Sudetenland. It looks like Hitler's got everything he wants without firing a shot. But for Hitler, it wasn't enough. Hitler is furious because without his little war, he can't occupy Pilsen and the Skoda factory that sits there. That's what he really wants. He has repatriated three million Germans in the Sudetenland. And for them, he's a hero. But for Hitler, they're just an excuse. He really wants the bigger prize. Six months later, Hitler's knockout punch into Czechoslovakia, rolling into Prague in 1939, is evidence that, hey, this boy ain't gonna stop at nothing. This isn't about the reunification of the German Volk, the German race. No, this is a warmonger doing a smash and grab. And what's so significant about knocking out the rest of Czechoslovakia? Well, what sits in that remaining rump part of Czechoslovakia? The Skoda Works. Hitler now controlled all of Czechoslovakia's banks, industry and armaments. 
It's been estimated that the Nazis acquired $28.3 million worth of gold when they took over Czechoslovakia in March 1939. They also acquired thousands of tanks, guns, ammunition, and most importantly, the Skoda Works itself. The ability to produce more tanks, more guns, more ammunition. Hitler needed something to bulk up his panzer forces. And when they took over the Skoda factory in Czechoslovakia, they got these. This is the LT-35. The Germans simply reclassify it as the P-35T for Czechoslovakia. Although the Czechs classify it as a light tank, it's actually got 10 millimeters more armor than the front of a Mark III, a superior 37 millimeter gun. It looks like a Panzer III, it fights like a Panzer III. To all intents and purposes, it is a Panzer III. And the key point is, they've actually got an additional 298 tanks ready for a much bigger Blitzkrieg. Something like one in nine or ten of the tanks involved in the invasions of Poland and France were Panzer 35Ts. And over 135Ts rolled into Russia when Germany invaded in June 1941. The Nazis now controlled one of the largest arms factories in Europe. But to make it work for them, they needed to install their own people at the top. By the time you get to the war, Skoda already employ a key family member of one of the top Nazis. Yes, Hermann Goring's brother, Albert Goring, was directly headhunted by Skoda pre-war. When the Nazis marched into Czechoslovakia, Skoda offered him a job as director of exports because they hoped that if they had him in place, then it would sort of stop the Nazis from interfering in their business. Albert went to his brother Hermann and asked him for permission to take the job with Skoda. And Hermann was ecstatic to agree. He gives Albert his blessing. In fact, he does better than that. He promotes Albert within Skoda to the general director of the company. So you have the brother of a leading Nazi who's now running one of the biggest armament producers in Europe. You would say that is quids in, that is absolute perfect play by the Third Reich. Let's be honest, for Hermann Goering, who's always seeking power, attention, glory, having his brother be in control of such a major armaments works was a huge feather in the cap. It would mean that works would be part of the Goering family, the Goering support system for the Nazi infrastructure. That would give him power and status. Obviously, if you're Hermann Goering, it makes perfect sense to have your brother running the biggest arms factory in Europe. It would turn out to be one of the worst decisions Hermann Goering ever made. It isn't until the end of the war that the scale of Hermann Goering's mistake becomes apparent, when Albert reveals his secret to the Nuremberg investigators. He basically claims that he was playing his brother the whole time, pretending to collaborate by managing this arms factory while secretly spiriting Jews out of the country and away from the Nazi regime. Now, the story felt literally incredible, unbelievable. And to Albert's obvious surprise, the interrogators, they, they frankly, they just laughed in his face. They are absolutely not buying this at all. I think one of them even says that he's about as subtle as his brother is obese. No, they're not buying it. It's utter nonsense. Um, and no, just no, Albert. It looks as if Goering's gambit is going to fail until a new interrogator joins the inquiry. Then we have Major Victor Parker rock up. He has an aunt called Sophie who was married to Franz Lehar, who is the guy that composed the famous Merry Widow. And his testimony is instrumental. Jewish Aunt Sophia had converted to Catholicism and she married Franz Lehar. And she gave Parker all these stories of goring the good guy, 
Goring, who saved individuals, including her family, from a fate, including death, at concentration camps. At the same time, you've got other people coming forward, and they too are now testifying to Albert's character. And actually, one of them is Albert's personal physician, a man called Laszlo Kovacs. And he tells this story about how Albert had him open up a Swiss bank account and that they'd been using this money to create effectively like an underground railroad to get Jews out of the area and to Lisbon. As Albert Goering's story unfolds, it becomes clear that he had even been working with the Czech resistance. Albert had contacts in the Czech resistance who confirmed that Albert had actually tipped them off about a secret U-boat base and Nazi plans to invade the Soviet Union in 1941. This, of course, was information that Albert had gleaned from his brother Herman. But perhaps most importantly, Albert turned a blind eye to all the passive resistance that went on inside his factory. Well, you know the old cliché that the Germans are efficient and the might and the efficiency of the German war machine? Yeah, scrub that. Not under Albert Goring, it wasn't. Albert, while running the factory, was the most ineffective manager known to mankind, allowing his employees to get away with a go slow which was of monumental standards. Work on the production lines always took longer, mysteriously, than it should have. Tasks forgot to get done. Crucial manuals, well, you know, they were mistranslated in key places, and important documents are getting lost. You name it, it happened at Skoda, to the point that there was actually an inquiry into why they weren't getting sufficient tanks out the other end of this supposedly amazing armaments production line. It got to the point that even Hermann Goering, in his drug-filled, booze-filled days, actually realised something was going wrong in the Skoda works, and he demanded a family meeting with Albert to find out what was going on. And he says, look, I need to know if you're using the whole capacity of Skoda properly. Albert produced a tale of woe based around the lack of raw materials coming through, the difficulty of getting supplies, the difficulty of getting labour, the issues which he was having competing with other works and other factories. So, <laughs> this is great. Whatever Albert said to him, he managed to mollify him that, yeah, the Nazi leadership had begun to realise that perhaps things were not all well at Skoda. This may not sound like much, but one of the key themes of the Nazi war machine throughout the war was a chronic lack of production. If you are running an epically sized factory like Skoda, then you are responsible for making sure that the Nazi war machine has tanks, guns, whatever, that you're supposed to be supplying. And if you're not doing this to the optimum level, it's one of the major reasons that the Nazis lose the Second World War. One of the most crucial pieces of weaponry to come out of the Skoda works was the Jagdpanzer Tank Hunter, also known as the Hetzer. Skoda built 2,800 of these during the war. Now that sounds really impressive, until you discover that Skoda's production target for tank busters was 500 a month, and by mid-44, that's fallen to 145. Similar war factories in Britain or in America would be quite happily churning out six to seven hundred tanks on the same size facility a month. This is how bad it is. All of this is at a point where Hitler's generals are desperate for anything, anything that can stop these waves of Shermans sweeping across Normandy after D-Day, and then you've got hordes of T-34s pouring out of the Soviet Union. What do you need? You need tank hunters. What don't you have? Tank hunters. And at the heart of this is the brother of one of the lead Nazis. You couldn't make it up. It's a disaster. It doesn't matter how good your tanks are, if you're not getting them out of the factory onto the front line, they're useless. But as the war drew to a close, the Gestapo grew ever more suspicious of the man in charge of the underperforming Skoda works. The Gestapo issued a warrant for his arrest, not once, but four times. And each time, Hermann would have to get Albert out of jail. 
It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think historically we always want baddies and goodies. And when you drill into that relationship between Albert and his brother Herman, there's a bit of Herman, you're like, he was a good brother. He was a pig, a Nazi pig, who killed millions of people responsible for their deaths anyway. But actually, he cut his brother slack. Blood is thicker than water. What's interesting is, Albert Goring, people sniffed him out. Things got so bad that in late 1944, the Gestapo actually issued a death warrant. Shoot Albert Goering on sight. It looked like time had finally run out for the good Nazi. Sometime in 1944, Albert Goering got wind of Nazi atrocities being perpetrated in the concentration camps. There's quite a lot of apocryphal stories around Albert Goring that have come out in recent years, but there's one told by a friend that's really memorable and also credible. It wasn't unusual for concentration camps to supply free slave labour for munitions factories in Germany. What I love about the resulting story is that Albert doesn't even have to try that hard to undermine the Nazis and their despicable actions towards Jews. He takes a convoy of trucks to Theresienstadt and just gets to the door and goes, I am Albert Goering, I am the manager of Skoda. Give me Jews now for the war effort. Now, that's not that unusual for concentration camps. So it shouldn't come as a massive surprise if the Commandant sees fit to hand over slave labourers without too much question. And you're going to hand them over to Albert Goering. You are. What happened next, however, was probably the biggest surprise in the lives of the poor unfortunates who believed they were being driven to their deaths. They drive into the middle of the woods and then the drivers go for a fag break. They get out, they have a fag, very casually and deliberately make sure the prisoners in the back of the convoy have a chance to escape. And then they come back and go, oh no, all of the prisoners appear to have run away. Thank you very much, Albert Goring. Quite what the Nazis made of this is anybody's guess. Now, it's entirely possible that no one questioned it because no one ever expected to see the prisoners alive again. You can get away with things like that, maybe once, a couple of times, but in the end, patterns emerge. So no surprise, by the end of the war, there's a death warrant on Albert Goring's head. Albert went on the run, and he ends up hiding in Prague. And Big Brother Herman did what Big Brother always did for Albert. He risked everything to save him. There's a sort of key irony there. Yeah, we can call this guy a saviour, but actually, who's got his back? But one of the worst guys in the whole Nazi regime. But by the end of the war, even Hermann Goring's position has been fatally weakened. He has to turn to Heinrich Himmler to get him to help Hermann save his own brother, Albert. And he makes it clear, this is the last time I can save your skin. In a strange twist of fate, Herman would ultimately ask Albert to step in on behalf of his family at the end of the war. It is the stuff of Hollywood movies, really, the story in many respects, because of this very complex sibling relationship, one tied to the Nazis, one tied to the defectors. They meet in poetic fashion. I think it's in a transit camp on the way to the Nuremberg trials, and they hug. Big man hug. And I, I believe Herman made some waffling apology about all the hurt that was going to rain down on Albert because he was his brother. And then he asks Albert, please, could you look after my wife and my child when I'm gone? Goering knows he's, he's going to die. But Albert's not in a fit state to do so. That's what's so pitiful. Unfortunately for Albert, he never got the chance to do much of anything afterwards. He did spend two years in jail, just basically for being Hermann Goering's brother. He's released in 1947. He's a broken man and he struggles to get a job. He's called Goring, for goodness sake. This is in post-war Germany, you know, and he gets divorced, he has an affair, he resorts to alcoholism, he never sees his wife or daughter again, and he dies a pauper in 1966. The factory he had run did not fare much better at the end of the war. 
On the 25th of April 1945, the US 8th Air Force launches its very last heavy bomber mission of the war in Europe. And what it does is to drop bombs on the Skoda works. And that destroys over 70% of it in just one raid. But despite the damage, very few of its 40,000 strong workforce was hurt. As the bombers headed over the channel, General Eisenham broadcast on the BBC, warning all the Skoda workers to stay away from the facility that afternoon. It was the first and only time such a warning was given. And it's almost as if the Allies wanted to thank the workers for the role that they had played in the Skoda factory. I don't buy that. I think the reason why the American Air Force gave the Skoda workers the heads up is we're at the end of the war, it's April. The Allies know that they're gonna win the war, but what they've gotta do is win the hearts and the minds of the countries surrounding what was the Nazi regime. It terrifies the Germans because it's basically announcing to all the populations of Europe that the Allies can bomb where they like, when they like, and the Germans aren't going to be able to stop them. It was a final death blow to the Nazi war economy. But not to Skoda. After the war, Skoda has an interesting history. To start with, the Soviets are quite happy to let the Czechoslovakians produce their own tanks, so they carry on doing that. However, Eventually, Czechoslovakia doesn't prove to be good enough communists for the Soviet Union, so they decide they can no longer produce their own tanks. In the West, Skoda is more famous for its cars. Skoda Auto was hived off from its parent company in 48 and became ubiquitous for cheap and chunky cars servicing the communist bloc. It became a kind of joke in the West. They were very utilitarian, they were kind of very socialist. Their diesel trains, on the other hand, were so famously reliable that they're still being used in Eastern Europe. And today, Skoda in the East is actually better known for its trams and railway vehicles. After the Iron Curtain fell, Skoda formed a partnership with Volkswagen in 1991. The idea is to produce cheap, reliable cars for Eastern Europe to help get its economies on the move as they recover from the abuse of the Soviet dictatorships. But slowly, they have improved. And today, they've got this fantastic reputation for really reliable cars. Skoda is back to where it was. It's a leading manufacturer. From guns and tanks to trams and cars, Skoda has transformed with the times. The wonderful thing about Skoda is it's a survivor. It's like the chameleon. It's just going to morph and change and adapt and keep on going, no matter what you throw at it. Who knows what I'll be producing in the future, but don't discount Skoda spaceships just yet.